We are continuing our journey through the book of Acts, and we come to chapter 18 today. So if you'll take your Bibles and open them with me to Acts 18, we're going to be looking at the first 17 verses today. Uh, and it's going, to be, it's going to be a little bit different. I'm going to incorporate the scripture as I go through this today. But as we go through this, I want you to remember this, is that there is no place that is beyond the reach of the gospel. No place at all. There may be places that we think are, but God knows and God will send his word to those places. As I was reading about Corinth and looking at this and trying to, to formulate this message today, I was taken back to when I was seven years old. And you're thinking, why would I go back to when I was seven years old? Because 1977 was a very pivotal year, especially if you're into movies. That year, there were two movies that were released that are instant classics today. Smokey and the Bandit. Now, Smokey and the Bandit doesn't have anything to do with this, but I mentioned that just to get your attention. Smokey and the Bandit that year was the highest grossing movie of that year. But people forget that because there was another movie that were, was released that has captivated audiences over the last 40 years, and that's Star Wars. I remember as a little boy walking in and just being drawn into that story. And there were so many characters, so many lines, so many places. You know, I, even when I watch it, I, I'm still drawn back to that seven-year-old boy sitting in the theater watching this in front of me. And one of my favorite lines in that movie, it's, it's kind of different, but it's toward the beginning when Luke Skywalker and Ben Kenobi, they're, they're riding in Luke's land speeder. This was after Luke's family had been killed. They come upon a hill and they look over the city. The city was Moss Eisley, and it played a very pivotal part in that story. And that was where Ben and Luke were looking for a ride to get off that planet to fulfill the mission that had been given to Ben. And they're there, they're looking over it, and Ben Konami makes this statement, you will never find a more wretched hive of scum and villainy looking over that city. And you know, as I was reading this, I, I drawn back to that because Corinth was that way. Corinth was a hive of scum and villainy in Paul's day. And yet God had told Paul, this is where I want you to go. And Paul went. You see, Corinth didn't have a good reputation. It was not a place you wanted to be known that you were from. Yet God called Paul, and Paul was obedient, and he went. And this is what happened. Look, look what happens in verses 1 through 4 with his arrival. The scripture says, after this, he left Athens and went to Corinth. Now, Corinth is about 50 miles, about a three days walk from Athens. And when he got there, he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had ordered all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, and since they were the same occupation, tent makers by trade, he stayed with them and worked. He reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade both Jews and Greeks. So he walked the 50 miles from Athens to Corinth. And we must not lose what he was doing. You see, in Paul's day, Corinth was the largest, most cosmopolitan city in Greece. It was located on the southern end of Greece on a little isthmus that connected 
the, the bottom half of Greece to the Greek mainland. It was a huge center of commerce. It had two ports, one on the east and one on the west. And what they would do, since it was only about three and a half miles wide as narrow as point, instead of sailors sailing all around the bottom of Corinth and Greece to go to the other side, they would transfer their loads from one side to the other. Think of it like this. We have the Suez Canal where it's easy to get from the Mediterranean Sea to the Red Sea without having to sail around Africa. It's the same concept that they had there. Well, now, how would they transfer them? I mean, here's the ingenuity that just blew me away. First, if it was a small load, they would pack them up on the backs of men and animals, and they would walk the load. And if the ship was small enough, guess what? They had a special roadway that they would put the ship on and move the ship from one port to the other and load everything back up. Because of that, this city became very, very rich because of all the commerce that was going through there. Now, have any of y'all ever been in Navy towns? You know, you have some very great sailors, but you also have some sailors that give the Navy a bad name. And the same was still true in the days of Paul. There were some sailors that were there that gave that port a very, very bad name. Matter of fact, there is a Greek word that when it's translated it means to live like a Corinthian, just meant that you lived in immorality. That's what that city was known for, and yet Paul was called there. It was a fairly new city. Most of the buildings there were less than 100 years old. But yet it was also a city that was inundated with idol worship. They had the temple of Epaphrodite, the goddess of love. That temple sat on a hill about 1,900 feet above the city, looking out over it. And inside the city walls, there was a temple to Apollo, the sun god. This is the city that Paul was called to. A city of immoral hearts, of hard hearts, and a city that was bent on idol worship. It was going to be a very hard and a very difficult assignment. But when God calls us to assignments like that, guess what? He provides for us. Because what did he do? He met Aquila and Priscilla. These were two Jews that were expelled from Rome. We can go back in history and we can see the time that Claudius did expel the Jews from Rome. And this is one of the ways that we can show that this book of Acts is a historically accurate book. He met them. And they were probably Christians when they left Rome. They met Paul and they found out they had something in common, not just Christ, but their occupation. And so those three started making tents. And it was a very lucrative business for them. And Paul became what we know today as bivocational. He was working in a secular job while he was also spreading the gospel. I can tell you from personal experience that's a very, very hard place to be in. I was bivocational for about eight years. And there are trade-offs that you have to make. But when you follow God, guess what? He provides for you. The sacrifices that you make, he upholds you, and he strengthens you, and he protects your family. And I can't tell you how grateful I am for that. And while he was there, while he was working, Paul did what he normally does. And what is that? Paul causes trouble. 
He went to the synagogue and he reasoned. Now, I'm not going to go over this. We've been over this so many times. He goes into the synagogue and he's telling them, Jesus is Lord. And he's using the Old Testament to show that Jesus is Lord. He goes and he explains and he teaches. And there's some there that get it and some there that's not. But that didn't matter to Paul because Paul was being obedient to what God had called him to. And that is to preach and teach the gospel. So these first four verses is the setup here where Paul comes into this immoral city where he finds friends, he finds a job so he can provide for himself, but he keeps true to his calling, which is to preach the gospel. And he keeps doing that. And he keeps doing that until the reinforcements come. And we see this in verses 5 through 8. That section of Scripture reads, When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia... Paul devoted himself to preaching the word and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Messiah. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook off his clothes and told them, Your blood is on your heads. I am innocent. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. If you mark in your Bibles, you might want to mark that. When they resisted and blasphemed, he shook out his clothes and told them, Your blood is on your heads. That is so important. So he left there and went to the house of a man named Titus Justus, a worshiper of God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the leader of the synagogue, believed in the Lord along with his whole household. Many of the Corinthians, when they heard, believed and were baptized. The Calvary arrives. Silas and Timothy come in. Now, some commentators say that they brought an offering that allowed Paul to stop making tents and start focusing on the gospel full time. We don't really know. It's a good assumption to make since he stopped. But he continued doing what God had called him to do. And what is that? Preach the word, preach the gospel. Preach, Jesus Christ is Lord of all. Jesus Christ came to satisfy your sin debt. And he was still using the Old Testament scriptures to prove to the Jews that Jesus is Lord. Now he was able to be with them much more. And the more he was with them, guess what? The more he irritated them. Church, never lose sight of this. The more we tell the gospel story, the more somebody is going to be aggravated by it. And why is that? One of two reasons. First, they've got some type of sin that that they don't want to give up, that they want to hold on to because it makes them feel good. Or second... They are so blinded by Satan that they do not want to hear the truth. That is what Paul was walking into. That is what Silas and Timothy were there to uphold him with. That is what Aquila and Priscilla were there to do, was to uphold him as he was preaching the gospel. Got two words for you. Membership matters. And this is why we uphold the family of God to preach the word of God to those that need to hear about God. And that's what that little group was doing. Upholding themselves and encouraging themselves so that the word would be heard. And Paul went and he testified to the Jews. And what did the Jews do? The Jews blew them off. But they just didn't blow them off. Their resistance turned into blasphemy. Well, what is blasphemy? One Bible dictionary put it this way. Blasphemy is a verbal insult uttered intentionally and malevolently against God, revealing the offender's contempt for him. Blasphemy is an attack on God's character. Blasphemy is telling God that he can't do what he says he can do. And that's what these Jews were doing. 
Now, we don't know how they were blaspheming, but we do know it got to the point that Paul could not stand it anymore. And he shook his clothes. For those that were in Sunday school a couple weeks ago, why was that important? Because what did Jesus say to do to those cities that rejected the gospel when he sent out the disciples? To shake the dust off your clothes from them. That was a sign that you are rejecting me. I have done all that I need to do. I am innocent. But now he also goes on further because he says, your blood is on your heads. The Jews would have known what this meant. See, there is a a passage of scripture I read almost every single time I get up into the pulpit. Ezekiel 33, 7, 8, and 9. And in that section of scripture, God says, if you tell them and they do not listen, your hands are clean. But if you do not tell them and they perish, I require their blood from your hands. He was giving them the very words of God saying, I have done what God has called me to do and I'm innocent. I can't control what happens in your heart, but I can control what I do. And God has given me a task, and I did it. I did it. See, these Jews were attacking the character of God in Jesus. And Paul was saying, I have told you who this is. I have told you who he is, what he is, what he's done. And you turned your backs on him. I am innocent. Church, there are those that we will tell the gospel to that will not hear it. God has not made you the arbiter of their heart, but God has told you to tell them from your mouth your story and what God has done for you. And when you do that, you've done what God has asked you to do and you are innocent of their choices. But if God tells you to tell your story and you don't, then whatever happens to them is on your head because you refuse to do what God told you to do. Listen closely to God's promptings so that when he says speak, you speak. And so he shook out, he said, I'm innocent. And what were the results? He kept proclaiming the gospel He moved out, and guess where he went? Next door. The Jews got a next door neighbor in the synagogue that they did not want. And God gave Paul a platform that he could not believe. He could still preach to the Jews, but now he also had a platform to talk to the city. And what happened? The head of the synagogue became a believer. And when that happened, many other people in that city became believers. When people see the work of God, then they are more apt to follow God. And that's what happened here. But although these people became believers, a lot of them held on to the baggage of their past. How many of you ever used Alka-Seltzer before? I refer to this church as Paul's Alka-Seltzer church because it always gave him a headache. While he was there and when he was gone, 
You want to see what kind of headache he had. Just read the first six chapters of 1 Corinthians. That breaks from all of Paul's letters because what did he deal with? In those first six chapters, he dealt with the issues that were in the church before he got to encouraging the church and teaching the church. But he did it. He taught their errors. He corrected them. And he was having success. But you know, the more success he was having, the more baggage was being brought in, brought in and he was getting more headaches because of it. So much so, guess what? We have verses 9 through 11. God showed up. God showed up in a vision. Listen to what the Bible says. The Lord said to Paul in a night vision, don't be afraid, but keep on speaking and don't be silent. For I am with you and no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you because I have many people in this city. He stayed there a year and a half teaching the word of God among them. When God shows up, things change. And that's what happened. Paul had to be feeling afraid because of what was the first thing God said? Don't. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid because the Jews are after you. Don't be afraid because the immorality that's in this city. You keep doing what I have called you to do. And God reminded him, I am and I will. And look at the encouragement that he gave him. I am with you. Sometimes we have to be reminded that God has promised never to leave us and never to forsake us. Sometimes we walk some very dark paths. Sometimes we feel alone. But that is when God is with us. You know, I love the poem Footprints. And I love the part where the person looks back and says, God, I don't understand. Why is it at the darkest and most troubling times of my life, I only see my footprints? Why is there only one set of footprints? And the Lord says, my dear, dear child, that is when I carried you. God never leaves us, but sometimes we forget to sense his presence. I'm guilty of that. God never leaves us. And that's a promise that goes all the way back to Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 31 verse 6 says this, Be strong and courageous. Don't be terrified or afraid of them. For the Lord your God is the one who will go with you. He will not leave you or abandon you. God told that to Israel before they went into the promised land, God is still telling us that today. When we are his, he will never leave us and he will never abandon you. But he goes on to say, no one will lay a hand on you to hurt you. Now I want you to notice something. He did not say that anyone was not going to lay a hand on him, but they were not going to hurt him. Paul had some rough times there. You know, and this is another place where these prosperity gospel teachers fail. You see, I get so sick whenever they preach that God will never allow his children to face discouragement or, or attacks. Show me in the Bible where God has promised that. God has promised to protect us. God has promised to shield us. God has promised to be with us. But he has never promised that we would not be under attack. When we are God's children, Satan comes after us. But the God who led his children into Israel is the same God that leads and protects you today. You know, and when we look through the book, 
He has promised that when we become obedient to him, we will live a life of chaos. And what do I mean by that? Because of the sin that remains in us. We are human beings and we have sin that will, is ingrained in us and will stay in us until we are resurrected with God with a new body. And our bodies, when we become Christians, our hearts and minds live in a state of chaos because on one hand we've got sin that's still in us wanting to do sinful things, but we have the Holy Spirit also in us that is leading us and changing us to be more like Him. Oil and water don't mix. And that's what we have inside of us as Christians. That's why God has promised never to leave us. Because he has promised to guide us. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, because thy rod and thy staff, they what? They comfort me, the shepherd will never leave you. And Paul was reminded of that. Paul was reminded that God was going to protect him so long as he kept doing what God had commanded him to do. Then he goes on to say, I have many people in the city. God was reminding Paul that salvation was his doing, was God's doing. But he needed somebody to tell the story. He needed somebody to tell the gospel. And church, this is a great reminder for us. And that God will call us to some hard places and we will get discouraged. There's no way around that. We will get discouraged from time to time when we follow God. But it is in those times of discouragement that we learn to cling to him even more. And when we learn to cling to him more, he becomes real in a different aspect to us. And we can look back and say, I could not have gotten through this except for him. We're going through some hard times. We will go through some hard times, both individually and as a church. But if we remain faithful to what God has called us to do, God will continue to use us. Church, we cannot count on not being hurt. We're going to get hurt. That's the nature. But one thing that we can count on is God's presence to sustain us. He has promised to never leave us and never forsake us. And that brings us to the attack. Verses 12 through 17. You know, anytime Paul goes to a city, something happens. Listen to what the word says. While Galileo was pro council of Acacia, the Jews made a united attack against Paul and brought him to the tribunal. This man, they said, is, per is persuading people to worship God in ways contrary to the law. As Paul was about to open his mouth, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or a serious crime, it would be reasonable for me to put up with you Jews. But if these are questions about words, names, and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of such things. So he drove them from the tribunal. Then they all, then they all see Sosthenes, the leader of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But none of these things mattered to Galileo. When Paul shows up, something happens in a city. You get riots, earthquakes, beatings, stonings, something's going to happen. You can count on it. And here in Corinth, the mob shows up. They drag him before the tribunal. And that's just like our modern day courtroom. But yet as he was there, Paul was reminded that God would be with him. Just like he promised. Because what happened? The Jews laid out their grievance. And before Paul could open his mouth, the judge shut them down. And I do not overlook the significance of this. Here is God protecting the church. 
By telling the Jews that he was not going to step in, Acacia was setting the precedence that this was not a matter for Roman law. It was not a matter for Roman law. You take care of it. This bought protection for the church. And what did the Jews do? They got so mad, they beat the leader of their synagogue. Why would they do that? That's a question I have. Why would you beat the man that leads you? Yet they did. So what do we take away from this? There's five things I want us as a church to understand from this. The first thing is we must understand that God may call us to places that are hard. Let me be honest about something, church. We are living in a day and an age much like Corinth. And what do I mean by that? I mean that people are locked into what makes them feel pleasure, things that give them a false hope for the future, and they want nothing to do with God. I heard this so much, I'm sick of it. It may be true to you, but it's not true to me. There is but one truth. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. Buddha doesn't get you to heaven. Muhammad doesn't get you to heaven. None of those things get you to heaven. Yet we are living in a time today that people say, I can make my own way to heaven if I am good enough. Church, we've got a hard ground to hoe. But God has placed us here for such a time as this. Second thing I want us to understand is that there are times God calls us to support ourselves. We may have to support ourselves as a church for some mission things. There are many ministers that have to support themselves. But that's not a badge of dishonor. It's a badge of honor and of trust because we are going to the Lord and God will provide for us in you in different ways to witness. We had the backpacks this year. Never done anything like that before. 72 backpacks went to children that needed it. I unfortunately had the privilege of going to uh, Nathan's school nurse, not once but twice this week. And each time I asked her, do you need more hygiene kits? And you know what? She is still overjoyed that we did that for her. And she keeps saying, no, not yet. Not yet. There are things that we can do to help others. And we just have to find new and creative ways of doing that. The third thing I want us to take away from this is that ministry is always better with support. You know, the Lone Ranger was not alone. Who did he have with him? He had Tonto with him. Ecclesiastes tells us that a cord of one strand is easily broken but a court of many is not. Here comes those two words again. Membership matters. Because we protect, we strengthen, and we uphold each other as we minister, not just to ourselves, but to the, to the community as well. These shoe boxes Jimmy could never do them by himself. Gwen couldn't do her by herself. Matter of fact, I bet you they would kill each other if they had to. Just with the amount of work that goes into it. 
But you know what? We as a church come together and we pack these boxes together. We send them out together. And you know what's going to happen one day when you stand before God? God is going to remind you of the shoe boxes that you packed to send out through this church to reach others. Ministry is better with support because we lean on each other. We sharpen each other. We have fun. Let me give you an example. On Wednesday nights, we've been talking about uh, some songs. Uh, for those that were here on Wednesday night, was anybody tempted to do the YMCA? Yeah. And why do I say that? Because I love to tell the story is wrapped up in evangelist from the 18th century, 19th century London, the Sunday School, and a YMCA convention in Montreal. And when you see how God has worked through all of those to give us a standard, we laugh, we cry, but we are bound together because Jesus pulls us together. The fourth thing I want you to remember is that God wants to remind us that he has called us to a place for a reason and he will sustain our ministry as well as bring results. God does not depend on you to bring results. God does want you to be obedient to what he's called you to do. Now this means that we're going to get discouraged from time to time. But we must not let our discouragement color our future. And what do I mean by that? Because as children of Christ, we have an eternal hope that leads through the grave to heaven. And we can never, ever lose that hope of what he has done for us. And the last thing, and I'll be honest, this last one is perhaps the most difficult one. As we are obedient to our calling, opposition will follow. Obedience is difficult. But the more we obey God, the more we get under Satan's skin. And the more we get under Satan's skin, guess what he wants us to do? He wants us to fail, and he is going to give us every opportunity to fail. He is going to push us. He is going to put things in our path to trip us. But if we are obedient to God, and we remember where our future is, guess what we can do? Every time Satan shows up to beat you down, you can remind him of his future. And his future is death in the lake of fire. So this dirty place, the gospel is for everybody. And God has called us to take the gospel. What are we going to do about it? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Father, I thank you for this day. And Lord, I thank you for your word. Father, I thank you for that city of Corinth. Lord, it uh, it's a, was a nasty place. It's a place full of discouragement. But yet you sent your man there as a beacon of hope and a beacon of light. And Father, I pray that you will use us as beacons of hope and beacons of light as we shine here to remind people that there is only one way to heaven, and that is through Jesus Christ. In your name we pray. Amen.